he comes in. So bear in mind, I've been in since 89. He comes in 91. We start doing jobs together. We have great success at those jobs. Uh, and sudden when he takes over, he gets me in, um, uh, in his office and he says, uh, you've been overexposed now. You've got to go. Now the normal progression for an undercover officer would be once you've finished in that line of work, to become a welfare officer in the, in the office. So I won't be doing any more undercover operations, but I'd be giving the benefit of my experience to up and coming, uh, undercover officers. And I think that's how it should be. And that's how it should have been. But he just says to me, this particular day, uh, on a Friday, I'm off for a week. He says, think about where you might want to go. Uh, when I come back, come and see me. So there was no discussion about where me staying in the office, I was coming out, which I didn't think was right. And uh, he said, oh, and then, he, and then he, he cushions that by saying, you and Reg have uh, been put in now for the Queen's, been recommended for the Queen's Police Medal, which I don't know if you're aware of the Queen's Police Medal, but it's the ultimate award in the police service from the Queen. So uh, I thought, that's pretty strange. So anyway, I, I go home that weekend and it was on my mind. So, so much so did I not agree with it. On the Monday, I got up and I went straight to police headquarters, Great Manchester Police, to see the chief superintendent in charge of the CID to see if this was right. <laughs> so I shouldn't go to police stations, yeah, shouldn't go on police courses, anything to do with the police. But so, so much so was I perturbed by what he said. I made that decision. So I go and see the chief super and uh, he says, you're not going anywhere. You stayed in the office. So what does that tell you? Seddon's telling me lies. He just wants me out. Yeah. So uh, I'm involved in that ram raiding job at that time. He comes back off his leave. I'm sent to Coventry. Doesn't speak to me. So the job goes on for however many more months and then they all get arrested, these lot. I spend another two months transcribing all the evidence for court. At that point, he then calls me in. By this time, I'm concerned about my future and about what's going on. So I make that decision and I go to see him in his office. He tells me to be there for two o'clock. I get there for two, and we're not at a police station, we're at a private unit, which to the outside world is a company. Yeah, that's what it looked like. So I go to his office, he's in this big office with glass windows all around, and he sat at his desk, wasn't talking to anybody. Two o'clock comes and goes, I'm sat there, he don't get me in until quarter to three, so he leaves me waiting for 45 minutes, and he wasn't doing anything. It's just him being the big I am. So then he gets me in, I've already made the decision to covertly record what is being said. So uh, he then says, um, I've never been afraid to uh, grasp the nettle. Uh, I've thought about what I was going to do with you. Uh, but uh, what was it? Act in haste, repent at leisure, he said. Uh, not only did you go and see your chief superintendent, you went to see my chief superintendent as well. We don't do that in the police, he said. So he says, it don't matter who you go and see, they'll always side with me because that's the way the system is. Now that, that, to me, at that time, bear in mind I've got all this on tape, it don't matter who you go and speak to, they'll always side with me because that's the way the system is. He's a big mason, the chief super, big mason, all these senior officers are in the lodge, yeah. Uh, and I don't know exactly at that point what he has been doing, I find that out later, but bear in mind what I do know about the flat, letting his brother live there. That would have got me sacked if that, I had got found out for that. If I'd gone off to Italy in the drug squad's caravanet, that's taking without the owner's consent. That is an offence of that. My point to you is, had he have gone and asked the chief constable, can I let my brother go and live in a flat with his, with his wife, rent free? Because his, his, his defence later on was, he thought it was better to make it look like it was lived in than leave it empty. Yeah, and he gets a reprimand for that. That's how that was covered up. What would the chief constable have said? Had he have gone and seen him and said, I'm thinking of doing this. Do you think the chief constable would have said, yeah, that sounds great to me. Because what if his brother had got beat up at that flat? Because there was villains lived in the block. He was a fireman, his brother. So if when he's leaving to work in a blue shirt and blue pants, they wouldn't think he's a fireman, they'd think he's a cop. So that flat is already compromised. Had he have not been found out, he would have allowed undercover officers to go back once his brother moved out and use it again and it's compromised so it, it, it's, it's totally I can't, I can't believe it now when I'm talking about it that he allowed it to happen 
Why did they have a beanie's born about you though? Because I wouldn't, I wouldn't do what he wanted me to do. So like his big thing was, uh, why don't you come drinking with the lads? Yeah, why don't you come drinking? The rule for undercover officers is: Do you think I want to go and stand in a pub with the overt side of the office, who are known as police officers, and be seen there drinking? The way I looked, seventeen stone, shaved head, earrings, be in a pub, and could be, somebody could be sat over there watching, who knows they're police officers, sees me stood with them, and then the following week, the job's asking me to go and infiltrate such and such a body, and that person sat over there could be involved in that lot. And my cover's blown straight away. So that's why I said to you before, when you're an undercover officer, your whole life is taken over. You can't go to places because you've got to be careful where you go, who you speak to, and what you're doing. And he just, he had a thing because I wouldn't go out with you, anybody. With you're the on officers. outside, then. But that, that was his grasp, perception of what an undercover officer is about. Did you ever ask to become a Mason? Did I? Yeah. No. When I was in uniform at Boodle Street, I had to work with there. Uh, joined a lodge in Bolton and we lived after I got married we lived near him and one particular night he says do you fancy coming to this do at uh, the lodge in uh, a meal so me and my wife went and when we got there halfway through the night I couldn't stand it <laughs> and we got up and we left and I never went again so it wasn't for me yeah and, uh, and, and the thing about in the police when you go for a promotion board for example you would be going up against an assistant chief constable, two chief supers, when you're going for a promotion. So they would be on your board and they would interview you to see if you're suitable for promotion. What's the chances of those at that level being in a lodge? Yeah. You go, percentage. I'm going in with, say you're a police officer, I'm a police officer, you're a mason, I'm a not. I'm, I'm, I've got even more uh, experience than you in some of the jobs I've been involved in. And we go in and they go, Oh, it's James from the lodge. Are you going to get promoted, or am I? Yeah, the, everything kept in house then. Yeah, and, and a, an example of that is, uh, you know, um, John Stalker. You heard of John Stalker? Mm. John Stalker was deputy um, uh, chief constable for Great Manchester Police. Then he got appointed to do the shoot to kill inquiry in, in Ireland. Yeah, the Hayshed murders, where these guys were were shot by the police in a in a Hayshed. And uh, it, was, it was thought that the police in Northern Ireland were shooting to kill without asking any questions first. So he gets appointed to, to run that and look into it. John Stalker, A, he wasn't a mason, and B, did the job right. Yeah, so he, he couldn't be diverted by anybody saying, don't say this, don't say that, and cover that up. Yeah. He, went, he went for the jugular and was just getting there. Then he discovers that there's a recording being made, an audio recording, of what happened on that night when these uh, got shot by the uh, police in this hay shed. So he, he requests it. At that point, because he's requesting this, which would blow the, the whole lid off it all, he gets suspended because some accusations made that he's been knocking about with uh, known criminals. Yeah. One of which was Kevin Taylor, who was a businessman in Manchester, who was uh, connected with villains in the past. He was from the car pitch in Ancoats. But he'd never been convicted of anything himself. He was a businessman, self-made millionaire. John Stalker was a friend of his. So uh, he gets suspended, John Stalker, and uh, investigated for this. And uh, eventually he is uh, exonerated and returns back to the force. Whilst he's been on suspension, the head of the CID becomes a guy called Peter Topping, another big mason who headed the CID. Stalker comes back. And what he said was, because I've read his book, uh, he said, had he never been suspended and still been Deputy Chief Constable, there's no way he would have allowed him to become head of the CID because he was inexperienced. Yeah. So when he comes back, he gets Peter Topping in his office and he puts to him the fact that he's discovered that everybody in the drug squad and everybody in the fraud squad is now a mason. And Peter Topping said, yeah, that's right because they're the only ones I can trust. <laughs> so how, how crazy is that? There you've got the head of the CID in Great Manchester Police has installed Masons, Mason, Masonic police officers, in the drug squad and the fraud squad. And he says they're the only ones I can trust. 
The others, I only think I can trust, is what he said. Now, is that right? Because again, I'll put that to you. Me and you might go to get in the drug squad and we're, we're, we're of equal uh, standing in relation to what we've done. You're a mason, I'm not. He's going to pick you. Purely because you're a mason. He says he can trust you, but he can't trust me. 